The opposition National Democratic Congress says Ghana's economy is on its way into an abyss. Despite claims by government, the economy is on a sound footing. According to the opposition, several figures and indicators churned out by Vice President Dr. Mama Dubaumia at Wednesday's town hall meeting were untruths. Addressing a lecture in Accra on the back of the Vice President's presentation, NDC MP for Bogatanga Central Isaac Adongo said, Due to the poor governance of the country, Ghana has dropped in the business and environment ranking from 5th to ninth place in Africa. Zadongo also noted that Ghana City is currently the worst in Africa and the fourth worst performing in the world. And so yesterday, the people of Ghana were served with what we already knew. That the MPP government, after having done all they could to win power, after having held some of the lectures that we don't even have the appropriate words to describe are still delivering lectures in government when they are supposed to manage the economy. Your Excellency, the management of an economy is a very serious business and cannot be reduced to comic relief and inciting the public against expectations that cannot be met. Mr. Speaker, whilst the people of Ghana were jubilating yesterday, especially our, our brothers and sisters who are into imports and are into distributive trade, reminiscent of the days of the first budget of the MPP in 2017, when the people of Abosokai were celebrating the abolition of import duties. I said to myself, this is the second deceit that will hang the MPP forever in 2020. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, his Excellency, the Vice President, made a number of profound statements that were not supported by facts. And so even as the people of Ghana were contemplating whether it was the economy that we knew or that we have suddenly been transported to heaven, the international community began to give a verdict. And I'm sad to report and to give a word of caution to His Excellency, the Vice President, not to once again plunge this country into international disgrace. Yesterday, Bloomberg reported that hours after the vice president made some of the claims that, that actually frightened them, the city reverted back to its unenviable record of being the worst performing currency in Africa. Your Excellency, Bloomberg reports that yesterday, the city was trading at 5.61 at a time that the Vice President was in Ghana celebrating this abysmal performance and a disgrace to the international community, I mean to us from the international community, because then we have once again gone back to be the worst performing currency of the, um, in Africa. But this time it was accompanied by us now becoming the fourth worst performing currency in the whole of the world. All right, so our resident fact checker, Raymond Akwa, has joined me in the studio. And we're going to be doing some fact checking on what uh, the NDC has been saying at their forum. But we're also going to be fact checking some things that Vice President Dr. Mamadou Bamia said at the town hall meeting of the economic management team on Wednesday. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond. So let's do uh, straight, in, straight on to what um, the MP for Bogotanga Central has been mm -hmm. saying about the CD. So he's indicating that the CD lost significantly right after uh, the vice president had made his presentation. What have you been able to establish? So, of course, I, he also referenced Bloomberg. So it's only fair that we go to the same site and find out what the Bloomberg rate was. If you check currently on the Bloomberg rate, this is that what we have today. Now, beneath this, is the actual previous closing day figure. And this is the figure. So you look at it, they tell you the previous closing day. End of day yesterday was 5.3075. This is the figure, nowhere near the 5.6 that um, the MP made reference to. I mean, of course, it's possible that in the course of the day, but if you checked yesterday's also, the range, day range, as is given today, was also between this particular end. It wasn't to the point of 5.5, 5.6, so that I can say that it falls within that particular range in the same way. I hope you understand. The right. So it is yeah. rather on the weak range that we see yes. uh, it going up to 5.86. 5.86. And it is actually 
this the specific figure he was referring to right. was the case for yesterday anyway. All right. Mm -hmm. So that's with uh, what uh, the MP for uh, Bogataga Central had to say. Now, mm -hmm. we also want to fracture some things that the vice president has been saying yes. on, mm -hmm. uh, at the town hall meeting on Wednesday. Yes, the, the vice president talked about the growth rate for 2017 being higher than that of the sub-region and also being one of the highest in the world. Indeed, except for the, the, the specific growth rate was 8.1 except for countries like Ethiopia and a, a few countries in the world. This was one of the highest ranking, uh, what they call growth rates, in the world at the time. Indeed, the IMF predicted that, that Ghana was going to be one of the highest rankings. Yes. It wasn't the highest, but it was one of the highest rankings. But he said it would be one, one of the highest in the world. Indeed, he said for the sub-region. The sub-region was extremely low. It was between 2.7 2.9. And the, the highest projection you could get for the sub-region was 3.4. So our growth rate in 2017 was indeed very high, way higher than the subject. So the vice president was completely right on all the three elements he said the growth rate filled in, in that particular case. All right. So he also had something to say about the debt figures. Yes. First and foremost, he talked about the, that of the year 2014 being 70.2. Okay. So what he decided to do is to basically take the pre-rebasing figure but you know that rebasing reference here was 2013. So it affects 2014. And use it for that particular period. If you use the pre rebasing figure, he will be right. But the rebased figure puts it at 51%. Just that when he's quoting the debt figures for 2018, end year 2018, he uses the rebased figures. All right. Of course, it makes it look way lower. But in a similar way, when he was quoting for even end year 2016, he used the old series and decided to use that for the comparison. I mean, of course, perhaps because of the politics of it, you have to decide which one you want to use. But so far as we've done rebasing, the new figures are all used. It's for a reason. It's because you don't want to be confused with pre-rebasing figures interfering the new ones. Because As especially when you're comparing. When you're comparing within a period, at least you would have to compare like to like and not ones that have been pre-rebased in this case. And of course, he also made mention about the actual debt that government, this government actually inherited in 2017. He said it was 122 billion. This is also false for a simple reason. You know, the figure was in our first budget. Then in the same year, the Control and Account General's Department came out to say that, no, the figure should be 120.3 billion, not 122 billion. Indeed, and our laws indicate that the man to tell us our true state of our finances and our accounts is the control account general when the auditor general had to audit it the auditor general also ended the same verdict of 120.3 billion and not 122 Two. billion in this particular case all right so mm -hmm. probably uh, w the one 222 figure should have been revised in the notes yes in, in, of course in the throes of preparing this yeah. particular one in this all right but indeed we're going to continue to mm. go through all that they have, they've had to say of, and then yes, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 with time we're going to be sharing with you exactly what we've been able to establish as far as uh, the verification of the facts and the figures are concerned. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond Aqua. But staying with the NDC Forum, former NA Deputy Energy Minister John Jinapo on his part described as poor the management of the energy sector by the Kufuado government, despite the solid foundations laid by the Ma Muhammad led government before the exit from office. According to him, the NDC handed the MPP an energy sector which recorded a 4% access to electricity threshold per annum, but the mismanagement of the sector has left it recording below 1% in access to the utility. He's also been describing the current power situation as one which is self-inflicted by the MPP government and which, if not, if not dealt with, the country's energy sector could grind to a complete halt. They are always complaining that there's excess capacity. Excess capacity. We knew what we were doing. Because we knew we were bringing in additional capacity, President Obama thought that we should scale up on access so that as generation is coming, you increase the access rate and then they consume the power. So when we took over, access rate was 54%. By the time we left office, we had increased it from 54 to 83.24%. It means that on the average, we're increasing electricity every year by 4%. Let's go. And this is confirmed by the minister in his statement, in the budget statement. Please, let's roll over. Now, 
I'll just talk about the previous slide. Because of the works you did, Ghana today exports 2.8 billion worth of crude oil. Whilst importing 1.7 billion worth of crude oil. When you look at the net oil, it means that Ghana is a net positive exporter of more than $1 billion of oil because of the work you did. In 2016, ECG made a profit of 725 million cities. 2017, under Akufuado, they made a loss of 521 million. 2018, they made a loss of 3 billion. 2019, they are projecting a loss of 6 billion. And so, in the past one, two, three years, they are projecting to make a loss of 9.521 billion. This is ECG. Their presentation to Parliament. It was presented in March 2009. And as you see, that's ECG's... March 2019. This is ECG's logo. We interrogated them as a committee. How many thermal plants have you signed in terms of PPA? These are the thermal plants. 14. How many thermal plants have you cancelled in terms of PPA? That's the figure. Zero. So the one who signed the contract says that having cancelled any contract... The minister sits in his office and he says that he has cancelled 11 contracts. And among the two, you don't even know who is telling the truth. Minority spokesperson on finance, Kassela Tuforsing, who was also at the forum, said it will be premature for Ghanaians to be celebrating over the announcement by the vice president that import duties are going down. The deception, the deception about the 50% and the 30% reductions in the import levies. Unfortunately, um, if you were to listen to him, he created the impression that from today, if you were to go to the port, what is going to happen to you is that the goods that you used to clear yesterday, you are going to get a 50% rebate. And then if you are to clear a vehicle, what you used to pay yesterday, you are to get approximately 30% rebate. In other words, that is not true. Unfortunately, I only wish to caution Ghanaians that please don't celebrate as yet because another abosokai is on the way. Another abosokai deception is on the way. They are lying to us. It is just a populist policy and it will get nowhere. Unfortunately, the benchmark values itself is illegal. The Customs Act 2015, and Your Excellency, you introduced this Customs Act. Right, so we will be fact-checking what, uh, in fact, reality checking. In fact, we have done the reality check, and Kojo Yang Singh has been to the Tema Porter, and he joins me in the studio in a bit. He's going to be telling us what he found out when he went to the Tema Port uh, earlier today. But former President John Mahama, in his vote of thanks, threw some jabs at the governing MPP. And one subject in communication studies that is core is public relations. Public relations is the arts of using different instruments to either maintain or improve the image of an institution or a person. And so, in putting out your communication as a public relationist, you try to present your institution or the person that you are trying to promote in the best possible light. And so you might sometimes be selective with your figures, present the best things, and then push the negative things to the background. But our lectures always reminded us that beware of your reality and keep your public relations and your communications as close to your reality as possible. And so we must keep our communications as close to our reality as possible. And so it is sometimes when people lose sight of that reality and begin to believe in their own propaganda, that is when you see some of the effects that we are seeing. And so the paraphrase I'll leave you with is, you can do all the lies and propaganda with the economy you like. The reality of the people's lives will expose you. <laughs> Well, joint news checks at the port indicate importers are beginning to enjoy the reduction in import duty announced by Vice President Mamadou Baumia 
at Wednesday's town hall meeting of the economic management team. The vice president stated the reduction in the benchmark value used in the computation of import duties, along with other measures being introduced, are aimed at making Ghana's ports more competitive in the sub-region. Joining us is Koji Yanks Investor at Temahaba on Thursday and reports some of the measures announced by the vice president have actually taken effect. And he joins me in the studio to tell us what he found out. Now, Kojo, there has been some ambiguity about the benchmark value being reduced. Some understood it to mean a 30% uh, and percent reduction in the import duty payable on general goods, uh, on vehicles, and then 50% on general goods. It have a turns out it's not that uh, straightforward. Can you please explain? Well, there is a little bit of complexity to it, but not so much. It's, it is, in the end, quite straightforward. Yes, 30% for uh, vehicles, 50% for goods. But for goods, it's on the benchmark values. So any good that is imported into Ghana that has a benchmark value in the customs system, that good will be, the, the duty will be charged on the benchmark value. That's how we charge duty. Right. So, so if, the benchmark value in this case is a predetermined value. That's correct. That's decided by the customs. It is already there in the system. And so whenever you bring that good into this country from wherever you brought it, that benchmark value is what they use to calculate your duty. And they are saying that from now on, that benchmark value will be reduced by 50% before they calculate your duty for you. Okay, so every good that falls into a category that has a benchmark value in the system will benefit from this. What, what was the rationale for this benchmark value? Well, I suppose if you were to apply it onto the real value, there might be a little too much variation. And in any case, you don't charge duty on the real value if there's a benchmark. So if you want to apply a discount, it has to be on the benchmark value anyway. Uh, but for vehicles, it's more straightforward. Um, if you bring in a vehicle, uh, a, a used vehicle, there will be some depreciation, and then you pay your duty. So uh, we have we spoke to somebody who brings in vehicles. This is Bernard Udru, uh, who is a, a career clearing agent. Right. He works for Trans Africa um, uh, Logistics, and he's been bringing vehicles in for years. And he says that if last week he had brought in a Toyota Corolla uh, worth say ten thousand cities. Uh, they would first have calculated the depreciation based on how old the car is. That would bring it down to a certain amount, and then they would charge the other duties on it. But now, before they at apply depreciation, a 30% discount will be applied to the full original 10,000 CD value of the vehicle. Which let's is in the custom system. Absolutely. The benchmark value. So let's hear, let's hear him explain it. All right. Now, um, uh, Bernard, you have already been through a part of this process today. Uh, you are uh, seeking to clear a Toyota Corolla. Uh, tell us uh, about your experience. I think, as you rightly said, uh, uh, it is very, very, very good and very simple here. What we've experienced, and it's very clear. Now, look, we're clearing Toyota Corolla today, which is 2016 Toyota Corolla. Uh, we cleared some that was last week. We paid 22500 plus. But after the implementation of the 30% on home delivery value. The home delivery value is like assuming I bought a brand new Toyota Corolla 2019 from America. As it comes to Ghana, I'm going to pay duty on the price that I bought the car. Now, there's not going to be any depreciation allowance. I'm not going to enjoy anything because it doesn't have any depreciation. It hasn't because it's brand new. Very well. But now, let's assume you bought the Corolla 2014 Toyota Corolla. If it gets to Ghana here, now because it's more than five years, the owner of the Toyota Corolla is going to enjoy 50% depreciation. So now let's do this calculation. If he bought a car, $10,000. Now, if it comes to Ghana, he's going to enjoy 50% because it's more than five years. Now, they are going to pay duty on the 50%. That is earlier on. Now, today, buy the same car. You before 10,000, before you pay your duty, on the $10,000, we are going to, you are going to enjoy 30% depreciation on the home delivery value. Before you enjoy that five years and over depreciation. On what is left. On what is left. And then based on the CC, that the engine capacity of your car, if it is 10%, if it's 15%, if it's 20%, customs will calculate the duty for you. So in the North Shed, if we were paying 15,000, when, there wasn't any 30%. Now, the duty that you're going to pay is lesser. Now, the one that I showed you, we were paying 22,000. 
on 2016 Toyota Corolla. Today, same Toyota Corolla. We are paying 15,600. So clearly, the discount uh, it's there. It, it appears to be working. Exactly. Now, um, I've got to ask you, Dr. Okwapia, I mean... Uh All right, so that was the explanation, and I hope uh, to the viewers out there it's uh, pretty clear now what exactly is pertaining at the ports. Now, the other thing uh, we would want to look at, the Vice President also instructed uh, a reduction in the fiscal inspection ratio from 90% to 10% by June 2019. Has this begun? Uh, yes, it has. And this was something that the Vice President was very concerned about. He was comparing how our ports operate to our neighbor, Togo. Yeah. Now, here it, well, in Togo, about 4% of all the containers that come through their ports get physically inspected. The rest of them, they have a risk uh, matrix that will determine whether or not you should do a random check. But if not, you go straight through. That's 4%. Here in Ghana, it's 90%. And he explained that it's because of corruption. You know, the customs officers want to take advantage of the physical inspections to, you know, elicit a little bit of cash from the importers. And, and sometimes that's, probably take some of the items. Absolutely. So now we want to ease, uh, you know, doing business in Ghana. We want our port to be more attractive. So he has directed, in fact, the cabinet has directed that that 90% figure um, be reduced to 10% by June 2019. Well, already at the ports, they have reduced it to 30%. Just today, just this morning. And they are going to take their time to work it down to 10%. That's the explanation of the commander. All right, so let's listen to uh, that uh, tape. Yeah, um, yeah, we started the implementation. Yeah, as you rightly heard it yesterday, the target is to reduce physical, physical examination to just 10%. Currently, we do about 70, 75% physical examination, that is red channel uh, consignment, and then we do about 15%, there about no, through um, yellow, which is scan. But with this new measure or directive, we have a target of 90%. So we, we, we uh, of 10% 10%. physical examination. So what we started today is looking at the reduction to 30% physical examination. And then scan will take 30%. Then 40 will go through green without any examination at all. Based on the risk management, or uh, we have a risk engine at the head office. So based on the selectivity, you know, criteria they, they will, you know, uh, produce or which will enable the consignments to be classified accordingly. And we started that. So as I speak now, declarations coming are having about 30% uh, for physical examination, and then the rest are either through green or through yellow. In that case, we don't want, we don't need to open any container and examine the goods physically. That's what it implies. We started the implementation, and we hope in the near future we'll get to the 10% fiscal examination target that was mentioned yesterday. All right, so could you, the, the effect of this is that we're going to get a lot more of goods being cleared from the port a lot faster. Absolutely. The system will become much more effective. And you could already see signs of that this morning uh, with the trucks coming in and out a lot quicker than we saw on Monday, which was the first time I went to the Even port. though people could take advantage of it. Absolutely. And in fact, when I spoke with um, the clearing agent, he, he called on his colleagues not to take advantage of this, his colleague importers. And uh, he gave examples of ways in which uh, they could take advantage of this. He talked about how somebody could bring in a container with, uh, and, and say that it was used clothing, which would go through the green uh, system, as the commander was explaining in that clip there. So that would mean no inspection. Uh, now, in the past, when that has happened, there have been instances when the customs officer, on a whim, has decided to check it and found that actually instead of used clothing it's full of brand new lace fabric very valuable which has fabric. a lot higher value absolutely and which attracts some serious import duty but uh, because they, they classify it as used clothes they get away with it and he's hoping that there won't be any such instances now that we're calling for fewer physical inspections all right thank you very much uh, kojo yang singh and kojo yang singh has been to the tuma port to get us that reality check we're taking a break here on join news prime but still ahead in the bulletin power supply restore has been restored to the eastern region town of somania after a violent demonstration which left two residents injured <laughs> Yes. 
And then in business, Ghana Gas to commission gas flow into the Abwadi processing plant on Friday, April 5. Power supply has been restored to Somenya in the eastern region after violent protests Wednesday night, which left at least two persons with gunshot wounds. Police opened fire on some residents who were protesting incessant power cuts. The angry demonstrators from Nuasu, Somenya, claimed all the towns in the Krobo enclave had been plunged into total darkness for more than three days, a situation they say is negatively affecting economic and domestic activities. They blocked the main Somanya road and burned tires to drive home their point. Police officers from Somanya and Akropong detailed to restore calm open fire, leaving at least two with gunshot wounds. Now, Eastern Region Correspondent Kofi Sian joins us live from the area with an update. Uh, good evening, Kofi. Now, it turns out the lights are back on in Somenya. What time were the lights turned on? Well, it's right. Um, I was in Somenya in the morning, and at the time of leaving the place, the place uh, had no light. But as I speak with you, uh, some four hours ago, the light has been restored, and the people there uh, now have light. Has there been any explanations from PDS as to why the town had to be without power for that long? Well, um, we have no official communication from PDS as to, you know, what really uh, caused the darkness. But uh, the residents are assigning several reasons to, uh, the, uh, you know, to, to what happened. They, they actually saying that uh, the PDS decided to plant them into darkness because uh, they owe electricity bills. But uh, there hasn't been any official communication from the PDS, just as I said before. And uh, how is it possible that the whole town would owe electricity bill? Well, this, this is a, a story that was uh, carried about two years ago. The residents were insisting uh, they do not want to pay electricity bills because their lands were taken over by the VRA when the Akotomo Dam was being constructed. So uh, as part of their corporate social responsibility, they were insisting that they do not want to pay electricity bill. Is it the case that everybody in the town is not paying electricity bill or some people? It's just some people who are refusing to. Uh, all the people in the town are not paying electricity bills for the past two years now. All right, thank you very much. Well, before you go, Kofi, I want to know what's the situation of the person, the persons who were injured in the protest? Well, they are currently uh, receiving treatment, and according to health authorities, they are responding to treatment. One of the victims is current. One of the victims is currently at the Akua Government Hospital, and the other one, whose situation was very serious, has been transferred to the Koforidia Regional Hospital, and health authorities there. Uh, are saying that they are responding to treatment. All right, thank you very much, uh, Kofi Sian. Kofi Sian is our correspondent in the Eastern region. The government is considering new measures to deal with what appears to be a resurgence of illegal mining in parts of the country. This was after a delegation from the Lands and Natural Resources Ministry discovered several Glamse operations in the western north and parts of the Ashanti and western regions, many of them with impunity. Lands and Natural Resources Minister Kweku Asumachreme, who led the team, was particularly concerned about the pillaging of the Upper Prama Forest Reserve in the Ashanti region and said traditional authorities close to the forest will be investigated. Joining us is Latif Idris, who just returned with the delegation report. Local authorities are doing very little to end, to end the illegal enterprise. This is going to be a shocker for the minister because I um, mean, the belief is that all these guys have been cleared from the various mine sites and the police just fired a warning shot uh, in an attempt to disperse these illegal miners, popularly known as Galam Sayers. 
and let's see if that that's gonna work. Hey, put your piece And the police just fired another warning shot. Still, so you can see in the background the Galam says are running away uh, upon hearing the warning shot by the police officer accompanying the minister, and there they are kids as young as 10. Five years, they are all running away from the mining site here at Nananko, part of the Wasa enclave in the western region. And it is unbelievable. This is just happening on the shoulders of the road. Just on the shoulders of the road. Are you surprised to see that these guys are bold enough yeah. to undertake this illegal business not deep in the forest, but just on the shoulders of the road. <laughs> yeah, I'm really shocked. Uh, in Akan, they say Okusia Utumi Mrikapa Onona Ufideria. So that you find it very difficult to arrest it. They need to acquire and procure the operating licenses from the Minerals Commission which they don't have. So it makes the entire exercise wrong. It is illegal. Yeah, workers are working on the other side. Inside, they say, only the operating permit is not. We know you agree on it. Sebi, you can't do it. You can't do it. Honestly, we do not have the operating permits to mine. But we have kids to take care of in the house. But you know you are breaking the law. <laughs> you know in Ghana, the only law people obey is the one that says men and women should not share place of convenience. The team also visited the 70-kilometer concession of C&J Alaska, where illegal miners we're having a field day. The mining firm, according to the managing director, Donald Enche, has been restricted by the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining from accessing the mine site and so has no hand in what the illegal miners were doing. I don't know where they are coming from. And like I said, as a concession owner for the past two, three months, I've been denied access to the place. So I don't know what is happening in my concession. We, we found equipment and some excavators on the concession. Mm -hmm. Are these excavators not as far out as of concern, CNJ? No. All our machines and equipment have been seized by the Interministerial Committee. So we don't have any machine on the concession as we speak. Mm. The last port of call was the Upper Prama Forest. The last time we were here, the forest guards of the Forestry Commission and members of the Interministerial Committee on Illegal Mining clashed over some activities of illegal miners here within the forest. Today, the sector minister, uh, Kwekwa Sumatreme, has led a high-powered delegation to see firsthand and assess the damage being done by people deep in the famous Upper Prama Forest Reserve. And that is why I'm here, to come and ascertain the situation on the ground myself. At least we have seen that uh, there has been some form of changes negatively on the ground. But we cannot allude to the fact that it was A or B that did it. But it is A's concession. We know, at least we know the one who owns this concession. Yes. Can, can we start from there? Yes, we know that it belongs to um, imperial heritage that was doing the mining over here but there was a hitch because as at then they had not procured the EPA license that led the interministeria to stop them from doing the work mm. so are you going to start with heritage the investigation into this oh all manner of people all class of people will have to be investigated, including the chiefs of the villages, about two, three villages, and all inhabitants over there. If we want to do thorough investigation, that is how we have to go. They live very close to the forest. The ministry says it will deploy new strategies to tackle the menace. 
Government says it will decide what to do with the Idol Commander Sugar Factory by the end of April after an audit report blamed the idleness of the factory on poor planning by the NDC administration. The factory, which was expected to process sugar, has not functioned for about two years now after President Mahama commissioned it. Amidst pump and pageantry, Minister for Trade and Industry Alan Chermanting was in the house on Thursday to respond to questions on why the factory has not worked all this well. The land size available for cultivation um, of sugar to run the factory at full capacity is also not available. That's part of the technical constraints. I've alluded also to the fact that the soil conditions uh, is a technical challenge uh, because that will create a, a fundamental problem of competitiveness. Uh, I've also alluded to the fact, uh, Honorable Speaker, that there was no viable grow, outgrower scheme that could support a new close plantation. These are all related to the technical challenges that I've spoken about. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in reference to the financial uh, uh, challenges, the previous government took a loan of $35 million to, as it were, uh, establish this fund. We've done a series of financial valuations, and on record, the value that is put now on the factory is significantly less than the uh, value of the plant as uh, one would determine based on the loan that uh, was, uh, was, was procured. And in actual fact, the original exercise that was commissioned to divest government's interest in this factory was clear that most of the bidders were not prepared to pay $35 million for, for, for the factory. So we have had to deal also with that uh, challenge. And um, a forensic audit uh, has actually been commissioned uh, uh, to go into this exercise. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that the paid evaluation process has been completed by the transaction advisor and a recommendation has been made for the consideration of the ministry and of cabinet. So, Speaker, I envisage that the final decision in respect of this matter will be taken by the end of April uh, this year. Meanwhile, the MP for Commander Edna Gwafu Ebrim, Samuel Atamils, disagrees with the Minister for Trade. He's talking about 6,000 acres. There is no way that you can get, I mean, you can set a factory within any farm. Yes, we have 6,000 acres over there, just like he said. But the farmers and then the chiefs of that place have pledged over 17,000 acres close by where they can plant, uh, they can do, uh, have the outdoor uh, uh, sugar cane going on. What they need is pardon, draw up on some of the loans that the government um, procured for them to expand their farms and then to be able to feed the sugar factory. The sugar factory needs about 100,000 tons a day for it to run. And these people are ready to uh, plant it. I remember the Commander Sugar Factory of old days, where, I mean, they, they could, I mean, they were harvesting sugar cane, even from as far away as uh, Mankasim, to feed the place. But this time, the machines that they have installed, the new factory has better machines that can um, produce uh, higher quality things, uh, uh, sugar, and there's a land available. What we are waiting for is the money for us to set up these outgrowers. This sugar factory could, could hire directly and indirectly about 7,500 people. How many NACO jobs can you offer to my constituency? Can this NAPCO thing even hire about a thousand people? No. So here we are. We are talking about one district, one factory. We have a factory that is already built. 
all those parts that he was talking about that were not built when he took over, they've all been installed. Everything, in fact, some of those machines were there. If there are any behind the scenes political reasons why this place is not being uh, allowed to operate, then you should let us know. Now, government is calling the bluff of the minority over their demands for the resignation of the Minister of Transport over the appointment of uh, Director for the Keta Port. A letter from the Transport Minister indicated that the appointment of Dr. Alexander Eduse Jr. for a port which is yet to be constructed. Keta MP Richard Kwachigan says the Minister is not on top of his job. This obviously is a cacophonous style of communication from government. It only means, therefore, that Honorable Titus Glover is indicating to the Ghanaian people that his minister is not on top of his job. And if that is the case, then the minister should be resigning by this time. Because if you want somebody to work as a liaison and you are putting him out there as a director, with all the pecs of what a director of port will take, then there is a problem. The fact is that the port does not exist. You want to construct a port. You don't need a director of ports. Of course, you will need a project manager. More so, we have two directors of ports who are redundant. They currently operate from the ministry, the office of the Ministry of Transport. And these are people who have worked before as directors of ports, director of Tama Port, precisely. So why won't you, if you need a project manager or a liaison officer, appoint one of these two redundant directors who are also being paid um, uh, by GPHA? I think that it's high time we are sincere with the Ghanaian people. Politics, as usual, would destroy this country. Our style of politics where we think that we can just take the ordinary people for a ride, will bring this country to its knees. Job for the boys, it's obviously a job for the boys. And we must admit that, rather than try to rationalize it. That'll be it. My name is Israel. I thank you very much for watching. Have a good night.